And good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Joe Sparrow from Music Ally, and this is the Music Ally uh, weekly Zoom panel show. Um, and I can see oh, a lot of people have arrived already. So we'll give people a few minutes to arrive and we'll go around and introduce people so that we know exactly who everyone is. Uh, now, this week's show, as we talked about last week, um, last Tuesday saw much of the music industry go quiet as it took a day to reflect and to initiate change. So we're discussing this week what the real next steps are and how and who should take practical steps to make a better future. And we have three very special guests this week and we're thrilled to have you all here. So let's go around the, around the table as it were and introduce them. Uh, they've all got deep, rich and varied experience in the music industry. So we're gonna have a lot of uh, variety of uh, perspectives and we're very grateful for them joining us. First of all, Monica Sani, VP of Business Affairs for Cobalt and founder of the UK Black Music Lawyers Network. Hi, Mulika. Hello. Hi. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, can, can you describe sort of briefly about either your job or the UK Black Music Lawyers Network and, and what, what you're doing with that? Yeah, sure. So, um, as you quite rightly said, I'm VP of Business Affairs at Cobalt. I sit in the London office um, and I've been Cobalt and I've been at Cobalt for nearing eight years. I'm, I'm, I'm a qualified lawyer, UK lawyer um, by practice. Um, and basically deal with the majority of the legal stuff. And I'll just say stuff for now. Um, that comes through the doors um, at Cobalt that's in terms of our, our writers and our performers as well. Um, in terms of the UK Black Music Lawyers Network, I set that up coming up to two years ago, um, simply for the fact that when I qualified as a lawyer and I wanted to specialise in music, which was over a decade ago now, um, there weren't that many black music lawyers around, whether they be in private practice or whether they were in in-house. And I always found it quite, um, quite interesting in the UK that there are a lot of diverse people and backgrounds within the music itself. So when you look at the charts and you look at songwriters, producers, etc., there's a diverse range of people but the people in the back office functions that are making the decisions are not. Um, and especially in my field, I found, I felt at that time that there just wasn't enough black people or black music lawyers. And when I was coming up, there's only two that I could, that I remember at the time. One of them is Dej Mahoney and one of them is Richard Antwi, which are, who unfortunately has passed away. Um, so there was just not enough. And I felt it was incumbent upon me being in the position that I'm at, at Cobalt to set up a network for those particular young black music or young black lawyers or professionals who wanted to become lawyers and specialize in the music industry as well, as a way to network, as a way to mentor, and as a way just to get some, some support in how to navigate themselves to becoming lawyers in the music industry in this country. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, moving on to, uh, well, I'm gonna describe you uh, as industry veteran, Keith Harris, uh, who uh, last Tuesday posted an open letter to the music industry that was widely shared all over the world. Um, Keith has done so much in the music business, I don't really know where to start listing it, but here's a few, uh, general manager of EMI, business manager of Stevie Wonder, former chairman of the MMF, chaired the Equality and Diversity Task Force, and uh, not forgetting that you also work with Marvin Gaye, Diana Ross, Smokey Robinson, and many more. Um, Keith, thank you for joining us. That's a, an incredible depth of experience you have. Can I, can I just correct a couple of things? Oh, please. Yeah, go. Uh, yes, go ahead. <laughs> First of all, I was general manager of, of Motown at EMI, when Motown was one of EMI's licensed labels. Right. Uh, and, and secondly, probably the artist that I'm, I'm best known for my association with is Stevie Wonder, who I've worked with for... 42 years. I mean, the others tended to be through my kind of Motown thing rather than personally working with the artist. And you continue to represent him? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Well, yeah we're, we're more mates these days. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good position to be in, I think. Isn't <laughs> yeah. it? And um, you posted this um, open letter to the music industry last yeah. Tuesday. Uh, were you either surprised by the reaction or how widely it was shared? I, yeah, first of all, you have to understand this, although I understand social media, I've chosen not to use it. So I'm not actually on Facebook or WhatsApp or Instagram or any of the, the popular social media outlets or back to any social media outlet. So as a result, I understand how it works. 
I rarely see it in action firsthand. So when I wrote the letter, the reason I wrote the letter was because I was concerned that Blackout Tuesday might be it as far as the music industry was concerned. And that people might feel, well, the music industry is fine and we've done our bit, we've had our Blackout Tuesday. And really I felt it was kind of incumbent on me as being certainly one of the older black music industry executives in the UK to say something because I don't have, I don't have my begging bowl out. I'm not asking for anything. I just actually wanted to highlight the issue. And I felt that I was kind of in a unique position to do it. So I, I wrote the letter, um, help, well, I wasn't helped in the letter, but I was, help, I was helped in distributing it by particularly my oldest son who's an artist manager, right? So I said, look, can you just make sure this gets out to the wider community? And he used these kind of social media skills to post it more widely. Uh, and yeah, the uptake was much, much bigger than I expected. You know, um, let's, let's hope it brings a positive result. Yeah, sure. And if, and if you haven't read it yet, I mean, you've, you've probably read it, even if you think you haven't. Uh, the link is in the chat in Zoom at the moment for you to read as we're uh, continuing. And last but by no means least, Stay Blue, uh, thank you for joining us um, with, as we mentioned just before we started, the, the, the greatest uh, and most perfectly composed background of all the Zoom calls that you've done. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, no, no, there's more, uh, but it's, it's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Singer-songwriter, Sound Connections trustee, uh, last week, uh, you posted a frank and powerful message about how black women and especially darker skinned black women are treated in the UK music industry and of your own experiences of it and talking about how change can begin through support and conversation and again that was something that was shared widely and um, opened up a lot of discussions and, and brought a lot of support. Um, how did you it just let's talk about just that the message you put out there yeah. first of all how was that received? Well, to be honest, I think I was just at a point of frustration when I was um, kind of hearing about the conversations around Black Lives Matter and always the women in the conversation tend to be erased or ignored. And I remember just seeing on Twitter that someone said, um, oh, now's not the time to have these, you know, intra-community conversations. Now's not the time to bring up things like colorism, colorism, sorry. And I said, you know what, now is the time. You know, if there was, if there was a time to talk about you know, inequality, if there was a time to talk about violence on black lives, let's talk about the violence on black women, let's talk about the violence on darker skinned black women, let's talk about, you know, other types of violence because it's just not as simple as, as you would think it would be. Um, so that's kind of why I wrote um, my Instagram post and shared it on Twitter. And I did not expect it to, to reach thousands of people. I did not expect to get a lot of comments, uh, messages of support and things of that nature from all races and from all genders as well. So yeah. that's kind of, yeah, that, that kind of empowered me and it gave me, um, it made me feel really, really positive that um, a lot of people had been feeling this way. A lot of people had been scared to say something or didn't really know how to articulate it. You know, I'm still getting messages, uh, you know, about it. And I thought, you know what, I have benefited so much from um, you know, the black woman who came before me in terms of, you know, jazz, soul, R&B, etc. And I think that I have a level of responsibility to, to highlight these issues. So that's kind of like my perspective. Great. Thank you. Well, that's great context for, to, to see how you've all sort of immediately connected to, uh, to, to last Tuesday and, and how we can sort of take the conversation forward. And uh, one more person to introduce. Uh, Patrick Ross, SVP of Digital Strategy at Music Ally, who is here. Hello, Patrick. Uh, this week, he and Music Ally's Kush, who's in the background, um, uh, sort of behind the scenes, uh, will be on hand to monitor the question and answers. Uh, so if you do have a question for the panel, you can hit the Q&A button um, and uh, you can uh, ask a question to the panel, uh, an individual, or ask a general question, and it will be filtered through um, at, at relevant points throughout the conversation. Um, they'll also be on hand to share posts uh, and links and questions in, in chat as well. So normally at this point, um, we invite uh, Music Allies editor, uh, Stuart Dredge, uh, to talk about the news of the week and what's been going on to set context for the conversation. Um, but we don't want to really waste any time doing that this week because the main story is here. So. This is a the show must be paused next step special. All kinds of music 
companies, Music Ally included, took the day of the 2nd of June to pause their regular work so people can educate themselves, attend protests, make donations, reconnect with communities, discuss ways forward. Well, we want to talk about those ways forward. It was clear that what happened, as you've all highlighted already, it can't be a one day event. It has to be the starting point of long term change. So we want to address the next steps for the industry to take. What are the actionable, structural, long term changes that should be made? Why should they happen? And who should be doing it? And what are the first steps? And maybe even we can talk close to the end about what are the signposts on the way to make sure that the whole industry is moving in the right direction. As a quick pricey of things that has, have actually happened since last Tuesday. Uh, today it was announced BMG have begun a review of all the historic record contracts, saying if there are any um, in, uh, inequities or anomalies, um, anomalies uh, we will create a plan to address them within 30 days. A number of major companies, Apple, Sony, YouTube and others, have each pledged $100 million to various organizations, initiatives and movements that fight racial equality. A number of labels and organizations, Republic Records and the Grammys, for instance, have dropped the term urban from use. And the organizers of the show must be paused, Jamila Thomas and Brianna Agimang, are kicking off phase two of the movement with separate branches fo focusing on social justice and racism and the industry's structure itself. So that's a little bit of context for where we are now. Um, you, you've sort of all spoken already about how um, your... Your, your, the, the, your work has been received within the context of the show must be paused. But uh, uh, I'd be interested just to start by a week later, how do you feel um, about how things are going in a general sense? D does this feel like the start of um, a, a more permanent change? Uh, perhaps um, Keith is the most experienced uh, member of the group. Uh, we could start with you because you have such a deep overview of the industry over time. Yeah, I, I, like, I like the, uh, the little pause of experienced. Uh, oldest. I, I'm trying to pick the nicest. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't mind. <laughs> um, but my, my general feeling, my, my overview is this is definitely potentially you know, a moment for real change. And the reason I say that is because this is the first time I ever remember companies, major companies, coming up with real money to try to do something. Now, obviously, a lot depends on how that money gets spent and over what period of time and on, on attitudes inside the companies. Part of the problem, and it's, it's a political problem with this, is if black people are going to find their rightful place in the business, it may well be at the expense of some existing white executives, right? Nobody wants to actually give up power. There are some hard decisions that need to be taken. You know, have you actually got the best people in the best posts at the moment? You know, are some of your best executives being held back because their skin, skin color, as you see it, is wrong? You know, um, we'll, we'll very quickly start to see by the, the movements that take place in the companies, whether this is a real dawn or whether it's a false dawn. You know, I mean, I think I haven't worked in a record company for years and years and years, but I strongly suspect that things haven't changed too much and that we all know of people who aren't necessarily up to it, but stay in the company because of, and yeah, I'll just be black, uh, pointed about it because it's an old boys network. And I mean, and I mean, old boys, you yeah. know, um, there are people I'm sure out there who really could have gone further already and been being held back because of either race or their gender or or they just don't quite fit in the industry and that's what needs to be addressed and we'll see how quickly that gets addressed. Mm. Malika you were talking initially at the beginning that you set up um, your lawyers network specifically to counter this to to structurally build a, a new route in and structure within the industry for black people. What, what do you think this time with with 
what we saw on Tuesday is, I mean, I'm not asking you to predict the, predict the future, but do, do you feel that there might be substantial change this time? Well, I hope there will be substantial change because if it doesn't happen now with the amount of exposure that's happened over the past week, I, I'm not quite sure when it will happen. So I think, you know, for, for all companies within the music industry, you know, now is a time to really take stock and reflect. Um, you know, obviously in the first week, we had a lot of companies reacting very quickly and not just the music industry. We've had companies around the world reacting very, very quickly. What I want to see now is everybody kind of take a step back, go back to your boardrooms and do an internal audit of your company. Not every music company is going to be profiled in the same way. So there are some music companies within the industry where they do have quite a lot of black members of staff, but you tend to find that they're geared to one type of department or one type of role. So, you know, what we have is a two prong issue within the music industry. The first issue is, is that we, we, there is a barrier to entry for black employees in general. And when we do enter as, um, as employees within the music industry, there tends to be a stereotype that if you're black and you work in the music industry, then you veer to either the talent side, such as A&R or such as marketing or such as management. And not to say that those particular roles should, we shouldn't go for those roles, but black people also need to be within the decision-making role. So hence the reason why I set up the UK Black Music Lawyers Network. We need to be part of those discussions, which are historically and traditionally very white male orientated rooms. So why is there very few black people within the legal departments? Why are there very few black employees within finance? Why are there very few black employees in many other departments in the music industry? So that's why I say that there's a two prong effect here that that's what's gonna happen over, from what I've seen over the past week. So what company I believe should do is take an internal audit and find out where are there, if they have black employees, where are they? Is there a discrepancy with the fact that you've got so much, you've got a lot of black employees in one type of area of the business, but none in the other, because that's a very different way in how you then respond to that as opposed to the music company that has no black employees at all. So I think what, what, I have, what I have seen or what I have heard when I've spoken to different people around the industry is, yes, everybody spoke in the first week that this happened, but now everybody seems to be kind of drawing back in now mm. and really thinking about what can they do as their company to actually bring about change. And that's what I've seen in the last week and a half or so. Okay, and hopefully that's what the kind of thing we can talk about here as well and maybe even help people make that decision. Um, Este, you uh, as an artist sort of work from the outside in when connecting with the established sort of incumbent businesses in, in, in the music industry. Um, what's your perspective on that in terms of what, um, what do, you, do you believe that from what you've heard or seen or interacted with, do you think that there is momentum for actual change this time? Or what do you think of it overall? I think um, there is hope. You know, I think that's the only thing that we can kind of cling on to at this time, considering everything that's happened. Um, but like, you know, many of the, the panelists have said, like, I want to see action. Um, I am an independent artist, and that is something that I've chosen to do by choice. Um, and I think that's important to mention as well that, you know, I have been offered deals. I have been offered, um, you know, production deals, recording deals, uh, single song assignment deals, and I've turned them down. Um, I've been um, asked to be on TV shows a number of times and I've turned them all down because of the terms, because it's not something that's going to benefit me as an artist. It's not something that's going to give me longevity. I am part of a sort of a, a kind of, a treadmill of artists that you know once that wave is gone no one hears from them and no one you know bothers to see how they're doing no one bothers to check in you know in terms of their mental health and their well-being there's no support for that so I think you know I, I think it's important for me to say that as an independent artist this is the most empowering position that I can be right now in my career because the steps that I take um, will benefit me um, and in terms of like Blackout Tuesday and what I've observed so far, I'm kind of interested in how 
labels source talent. I'm concerned as well in terms of women artists. I have mentioned before about the, the kind of the color spectrum of it because that is a big deal. Um, I'm not sure we could name five black female artists that have achieved the levels of success that Stormzy or Dave has in the past five years. We cannot do that because there are none. Um, I'm also concerned about the age of artists that are being recruited. Um, these young girls and boys are not even being um, sorry, able to kind of finish their education. Um, this is important because it means that once your term is up, what do you do next? So I think, yeah, my, my concern is always like in terms of the safeguarding of the artists, you know, where they're being kind of sourced from. Um, also the kind of pressures that um, artists have to deal with in terms of that age thing, you know, especially for women artists, you will not see a woman artist being like promoted after the age of 25. That is a problem. That is a big problem. Um, and I think it's a problem that men don't have to kind of experience. Um, you know, Skepta did very well in his 30s. I would love for a woman artist to do very well in her th 30s or 40s as well. Um, so those are just kind of some of the concerns I've, I've um, kind of thought about over the past week. Yeah. Um, one, I think we're starting to get towards perhaps structural change that, that, that can happen. We'll talk about that. Uh, Keith, one thing you mentioned, I'll, I'll perhaps throw this to you, Malika, first, um, about the, the, the idea that money is being committed and money needs to initiate change. Um, the major labels have committed in the last week uh, approximately a quarter of a billion dollars ostensibly to support black community projects in, in the music industry and beyond. Money talks. So um, Malika, if we can start with you, what, what sort of actionable things, when we talk about change, what can this money do? And what should it do? Um, <laughs> it's a good question. Mm. Um, I think b before I answer that question, you know, what I, what I want to make clear is that whilst money is fantastic, and it's great to have these funds set up. There are certain things in which money cannot and will never achieve in terms of changing. And I think this is what most companies need to understand mm. in that, um, yes, you can set up funds and you can, those funds can be to educate people and those funds can be to set up training courses and et cetera, et cetera. But what money can't do is money does not determine the fact that one person receives a job over another person, despite the fact that that person who received the job is less qualified than the black candidate. Money can't change that. So I think what, what, what most music companies, or in fact all music companies need to understand is that it, it can't be just that you're using the money and that's your duty done and we can move on. No, there has to be two, there has to be two things running in parallel. So there has to be an education on to this as well, because this is all about education. This is all about educating people as to the unconscious and the conscious things that people are doing within the workforce to prevent black employees and black artists and black managers, et cetera, et cetera, from progressing. So there's an educational piece. There and then obviously you have the, the, the money side of it as well. So yes, the money can be used to provide that education. And we don't just need just anybody who believes that they can do diversity and inclusion training. What we need, are, or what all the company needs are people who actually are embedded in that. That's what they've been doing for years. Because what I'm, what I'm quite concerned about is that you may get a plethora of people now who can tell you that they know about diversity and inclusion, and they really don't. So, you know, it's, it's a case of using that money to empower communities, um, empower you know schools colleges universities scholarships internships we spoke at you know Keith has mentioned this old boys network before and that's quite key in that this old boys network has prevented a lot of people from um slightly less advantaged backgrounds and when I use the term less advantaged backgrounds I want it to be made very very clear I'm not talking about black people I'm talking about anybody from a less advantaged background what the music industry historically has done has always been, well, I know somebody who plays golf with my dad at the weekend. Well, not everybody comes from that sort of background. 
So what would be good is if the music industry used the pots of money that they have, that they have set aside. You know, $100 million is no chicken change. That's a lot of money. A lot of money in which you can do a hell of a lot of things on. So what we need to see is that they actually have a plan as how to execute those funds. You know, what are you going to use those funds for? How are you going to use them? Are you going to, you know, are you going to contribute to communities? Are you going to contribute to schools? Are you going to set up, like I said, scholarships? Are you going to set up training programs? Are you going to use that money to actually fund mini schools or whatever the case may be? But we need to actually see a plan of action as to what these companies are doing with the money. And I could give very, I, you know, I could say that every company should do this. But like I said before, before a company can decide what it needs to do with the money, it needs to do an audit of itself. Once you know what you what your company is about and where you are lacking and the people that you have in your organization, because there are a lot of talented people within all of these music companies that are more than happy to give back to the community. And they don't just have knowledge of music, they have knowledge of other areas as well. So it's about tapping into their own people and asking them, how do you want us to help? How do you want us to help the community? How do you think the community will benefit from this money? And like, it's very easy to throw these numbers about and say, yes, we've done our part, but not actually sit down and ask the people who are part of that community. So people like myself, what would I like to see within my own community? What would I like to see amongst the young black people of, of South London? And I think those are the questions in which record, not even just record company, sorry, the music industry needs to ask their, their internal employees. Yeah. Um, Keith, you, you've worked in a number of large companies in the music business over the years. It's, it's easy to, to be a bit cynical when big numbers and big money is conjured up and say, well, you're maybe there's an idea that by putting a lot of money out there, it sort of makes the problem go away a bit. Um, what Monica was saying was about structural change and initiating it. How do you think that these big companies are going to be more having stumped up big money and made a public announcement? Do you think they're, they are going to be uh, actioning these kind of internal audits, structural changes and, and sort of how they reach out to the world? To be perfectly honest, what's been exercising my mind for the last couple of weeks is how do we actually bring them to account? Yeah, because it's all very well saying it, um, but who's actually watching what happens? In two, three years' time, it should be totally unacceptable for large music industry companies to have no minority board members. You know, somebody needs to be looking at that and monitoring that. There is obviously the UK Music Equality and Diversity Task Force that I used to chair that's in a position to do that. But somebody really needs to look and see what is actually going on. Because in my letter, the stuff I'm talking about, the, well, the example that I chose to pull up, I could have brought loads of them. That happened in 1978. Right? We are now in 2020. That's a long time. And the same conversations are being had. So we, we really have to monitor what's going on. I remember I took part in a documentary in, I think it was about 1990, and it was, for, it was made by the British Black Music Association for open space, it's called Soul Searching. And in that documentary, there were a whole series of music industry employees saying, um, you know, senior figures in the industry saying things like, well, you know, really the black community just needs to be a bit more patient. You know, we are, we are getting there. I mean, you know, you know, a couple of years ago, there were, there were no black employees in our companies. If people are patient, then it'll correct itself. Well, how patient do you need to be? Mm -hmm. This was 1990 or 1991, you know? So we are now 30 years on from there. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons why the whole focus of my letter was What's going to happen to the generation coming through? What's going to actually happen from the youth? Is because in society, probably one of the big things that has changed is when I was really starting out, 
there was very little, uh, well, I wouldn't say very little, but the social interaction between communities was at a lower level. And I was very pleased to hear Malika talk about um, economic disadvantage and say that's not just a black issue. That's an issue across society. But the industry really hasn't addressed that. You know, it's, it, mm. it is obviously because black people in Britain tend to be on the social, lower socioeconomic strata, the disproportionately represented there. But the same applies to, to young white people trying to get into the music business. You know, it can't be a closed shop. You've got to sort of open up the whole of the industry with that money to make sure the best people get advanced in the industry. You know, and, and that's kind of what needs to be monitored. I think that's the, the key thing is who's going to monitor what happens with the money. Mm. Um, Estée, you are you are one of the younger generation coming through that uh, Keith just spoke about. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to speak for an entire generation now. Um, but um, you know, we've spoken about education and change there. As you are looking to get in, you spoke about your the frustrations, the difficulties of getting the foot in the door. What what could work better for you? What would be better? How would how would that look from the perspective of, of an artist? I think um, it's important that artists first of all know that they have a choice, um, that a company like a record label or you know a distribution company like that option may not work for you, it may work for you, it may not. So there kind of needs to be an education around um, the different types of deals an artist can sign um, and what is more profitable to them short term and long term and having these kind of business development conversations with artists at the very beginning um, so that they kind of know that they have options. Um, in terms of kind of getting your foot in, I would always encourage artists just to keep doing what they are doing. And I know that that might not sound, um, that might not sound um, like a solution, but I think there is power in just kind of pressing on and also having the time to figure out what it is you want to do um, without being pressured because signing a contract is a legally binding um, agreement that's going to tie you up for two to three, not even two, two years minimum, five years, you know, is the, is the average. Um, and yeah, you need to be able to know like what it is that you're signing yourself up for and also um, agreeing to kind of being a part of that or not. So I think I'm not really sure if I'm making sense at the moment, but no, I think no, no, there's, there's like, there's a lot to be said for like the education of artists, like knowing what you are walking into. And if you don't want to agree to those terms, you have the option to say no as well. Or and that's about, like, that's about education, isn't it? Where yeah, if, you, if about, they feel empowered to do that, they'll do it. Yes, but a lot of artists um, probably don't know where to start. If they don't have a manager or they don't have a, a good manager, these terms are not being explained to them and they are blindly signing away, you know, their copyright, their intellectual property um, to big corporations who we've seen don't care about not only their community, but their art as well. So I think that's the most frustrating thing for an artist. And we have seen, you know, on, on Twitter, on social media, a lot of artists speaking out, artists who are signed, you know, I know artists who are signed and they're stressed, you know, they're mm. stressed out, um, some are depressed, you know, some people are really upset about the terms that they committed to because they believed that that was the thing that would change everything. And unfortunately, it didn't. Mm. Um, it, it, it gave them a lot of pressure, a lot of financial pressure um, and stress to now shoulder until that agreement is finished. And when the agreement is up, I wonder if these artists will still have that same spark, that same joy um, to create the very music that we all love from them. Mm. Yeah, thanks to say, Patrick. We've we've got a couple of questions in in the Q and A section. Again, if you if anything uh, triggers a thought uh, and a question you want to ask, please do put it in there, and the panel will answer it. Uh, Patrick. Yeah, we've had a we have a couple that came in. Actually, the a few of them were answered already on screen without me having to bring them up. So well done, everybody. Um, Malika, you're getting a big up from South London. I'll just uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll shout that one out to you right now. But also in that comment, Marcus is just saying that it's more. Um, about equal respect. And there's a follow, another question also about how long this will take. Someone, uh, Trixie's asked from the audience basically, 
um, having the concern that, you know, it's, it, this is going to take too long is what she's said and wants to know from the panel what we can do to expedite this and push this forward. And I'd also like to ask, given I know our audience today, and I'm, I'm looking at a lot of the numbers and thank you for people that are coming in, but you're we're very much addressing a music industry audience here today. That is the, the music ally audience. And of course the money side of it is great. We've all talked about this and these things at the top that, you know, they seem good. I don't want to say that they're lip service, they're a commitment, but you know, is there anything also for those of us that work in this day to day that like, I feel like, um, just to give an anecdote, uh, a friend of mine in Norway, they, they actually played on children's television, the, um, the George Floyd killing on children's TV. And she, a friend of mine who has mixed race kids said, mommy, what is this? And watched it. And suddenly as a child, and this is something she, you know, this is Norway, it's a very different country than the United States, but suddenly asking what's going on here? What, what is this? And the fact that we are all leaning in probably, you know, COVID situation right now, everyone's feeling vulnerable. Is there anything outside of just this big money? And I think you've answered a lot of where it can go, but what, what can we all do as an industry on a day-to-day -day basis, on a, on a changing of behavior basis? I mean, is there any recommendation mm. in that sense? Can I, just, can I say one thing? And that is that being silent when you know something is wrong is tacit complicity, right? And that's been one of the big problems is that lots of people disagree, they hear things said, which they know are wrong. And they don't necessarily agree with it, but they don't challenge it either. Because obviously they, they are concerned about their employment, they're concerned about their, their prospects. Good people need to speak up. That's the first step. Because there's a lot, a lot of things that just go unchallenged and every little one is an incremental step you know, to um, keeping somebody suppressed. And I think that's probably one of the biggest immediate things. In terms of how long it should take, I think that, as I said, within three years, I think there's, there is no excuse for any major company not to have some kind of minority representation at board level. Wouldn't expect it to happen within three weeks because you've got to find the people, but the people are out there. So let's find them and let's get them in decision-making roles because it's, mm. it's so easy for people to make excuses about you know, why there's nobody making those kind of decisions. Things, if you are not affected by it, you tend not to speak out on it. You know, so we need those people in position, decision-making roles, a place where we can appoint people. A little bit of data around that. Um, analyst uh, Sherry Hu mentioned this week, uh, she did some analysis and said of board members and C-suite executives across the top three record labels, their biggest imprints, as well as Live Nation and AEG, essentially some of the biggest um, businesses in the, in, the, in, the, in the business. Of 61 board members and C-suite executives, only five of them are black, um, which is a, a, a pretty damning statistic. Um, Monica, perhaps to move across to you on, on this, we're talking about practical change. Keith says you know, it can't happen in three weeks, but it can happen relatively quickly, right? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't see why it can't, because to my mind, as, as Keith has already quite rightly said, I believe that these people are already within these companies. They're, 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 already, within, they're already working within these companies. They're already there, you know, and, it, and it's not just you know, it's not just the barrier to entry to get those jobs, but it's also the barrier to actually, you know, succeed up the ladder. And again, you know, Keith mentioned earlier, there's this fear that, you know, people don't want to relinquish their seat at the table. And I think that that mindset of the table needs to be altered in that you can increase the size of your table. Your table does not always have to sit just 12 people. Hmm. It can grow from 12 to 15 to 24 to whatever. So, you know, again, I, I think it can happen quicker because as I said, a lot, of the, a lot of the people who can do these jobs are already within the industry or they were already within the companies. And this is why, you know, I say as well, you know, companies need to do that when they do their internal audit, look at your skill set, look, look at the black employees within your companies and see what their skill sets are. Because as I said, a lot of them could be 
fast tracked very quickly if you sit down and you look at what they're doing. And again, you know, it, it, and you know, we've spoken about that old boys network. We need to get past that. We need to get past that. And we need to get past that notion of that there's no more than 10 people can be at the table or there's no more than 10 people can be at board level. You know, the fact that you're saying that there's only five out of 60, that's, that's, that's disgusting. It's, you know, let, let's call it for what it is. That's just not acceptable in this day and age where black, black people in some way, shape or form have their hands in such a large proportion of what you're hearing. All of us will turn off today and at some point listen to Spotify, New Music Friday. I can guarantee you that if you look at the New Music Friday, at least 50% of that will be either if it's not a black artist, it's a black songwriter or a black producer, etc. So the, the numbers don't tally and we need not sit here and say, well, it will take five or 10 years. I totally agree with Keith. If, if three years we've not seen change, then that's, a delib that's deliberate. And we have, to, we have to acknowledge that if in three years we do not see the relevant representation at C-suite level, then I can only look at that and go, well, that company has now deliberately not wanted to do that because you can't tell me that the talent is not there. And I've heard that rhetoric said time and time again, well, we can't find the people. It's rubbish. I can, I can name you several people within the legal field. I can name you several people within the finance field who were just as good or even excel the people that I know that work in these various different departments in various different companies. So that it's not that the talent's not there. So you, you need to dig a bit, a little bit deeper as to why you're not going out and seeing that, seeking that talent. Mm. It's interesting, I mean, sorry to, to yes, good. continue that point um, about not being able to find people. I was involved in the BA in commercial music at the University of Westminster back in 1992. And one of the reasons, one of the things that attracted me to doing that work was the fact that at that time people were saying, well, there aren't enough black people qualified rubbish. coming at executive level. It's rubbish. So once we started to have degrees, where well, we had a very significant BAME representation on the course, so they were equally qualified. So that removed one of the big obstacles that people said to entry. And still we're here, 20 years on with the same problem. So it's not that you can't find the people, the people are there. It's just a will to promote them. Exactly, and just to add on top of that, historically, you know, as black people, we've always found that we have to double our efforts to get half. So not to say that this is, a, that this is the case, but you'll tend to find that the majority of black people out there probably have the skill set and experience that is sometimes a lot more than the people that are doing the job because like I said historically we've always had it in our you know I remember when I was coming up that like, you know my mum always used to say and my dad always used to say to me you're going to have to work twice as hard to get half as what your counterparts are getting so again that in itself leads to the to the statement of well there's not we can't find anybody it, that, that's just that's a nonsensical statement um there's a couple questions from the audience. We've started kicking off in the Q&A in a nice way. Um, what have you done? <laughs> um, yeah, well done, you all. Um, I'm going to try and tie a few of these together. But, but And actually, this one comes from Kush, who uh, actually works at Music Ally and is our secret panelist here running the background. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll try to put a few of these together. But in an industry where so much is based on relationships, as we all know, and what we've just noted about those C-level executives, um, and, and that whole idea. Are there any recommendations? We've actually had someone uh, that says, I'm a young black man that would like to basically start my own iTunes. Um, but is there any recommendations for you all about that network? Because it is all about who you know and whether that's nepotism or just at the basic level of you know, who your, your con connection is. And as part of that, from tying all these together, um, is there also anything that we can actually do at companies rather than just saying we're putting money but actually trying to look at the hiring process and understand why we're not attracting uh, you know, a certain level. I mean, if this is from someone hiring saying we don't get enough black applicants, we don't get enough, if that is what, what their case is, what, what can we actually do? And what can we actually do to work on these relationships, I suppose, as a community for those of us that do want change? Can I, can I answer this? 
Um, I would say that there are a lot of um, talent development organisations. I work for what no, work for one. I am the trustee of one, Sound Connections. And they also host an arm called Wired for Music that works with young people, predominantly from black um, and minority ethnic backgrounds. So it's a case of the industry partnering with uh, organisations who are already on the ground to um, not only source talent in terms of the artists that they work with, but to source talent in terms of um, who can move into, um, you know, business development roles or legal roles, etc. Um, the Mobos is another, you know, great talent development platform. They host their arm called Mobo Unsung, and I had the opportunity to be a part of that as well. What I would love to see is the Mobo Unsung network expand into an education, um, you know, facility or hub or something, because Kanye King has a track record of. Um, you know, recruiting the best black British music artists and giving them a stage and amplifying it, you know, uh, from when I was, you know, a, a small child, I've seen her do her thing year in and year out. So there are organizations that are already doing it and it would be good to see the industry pour more money behind it. And um, perhaps we can, I know there's a lot more questions uh, coming, Patrick, but I wonder if we can, while we're talking about artists and the, and the, and the and artists and how they're rewarded and how they work in the industry, um, there's been a bigger sort of question. That, I mean, obviously the world has been a very turbulent place recently and a lot of d difficult questions are starting to be asked in lots of different ways. And one of them that, that we've discussed here a little bit recently is about um, payments to artists and the contractual relationships. Esther, you've talked about this a lot uh, already and I'd like to go back to that a little bit. Um, the industry has, uh, is uh, supposedly addressing exploitation and inequality, though, of course, the, the pop music industry is based entirely on black music and has historically um, given poorer contracts to black artists over the years. Um, and that a lot of which probably still stand. Mm. Um, do you think that now is it would, first of all, would changing the royalty payments and increasing the money that goes to artists be a good starting point uh, in general for um, uh, improving uh, the, the opportunities for, for black artists and, and in the music industry. And should labels go further? And uh, Keith, maybe this is a question for you and, and look at contracts, contracts and Monica as well that have been signed a long time ago and, and change them drastically. I would oh. definitely say, oh. Yes, well, well, so let's questions. start with you, Estee, because you've, 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 you've been talking about this already, and then we'll pass yeah. to you. Um, yes, yes to both questions, because like I said, um, it's interesting because even in my artist career, um, I also have like a background in education, like I used to be a French teacher, um, I'm now doing my master's, um, and I know that not everyone can, can do that. So when I have been presented with contracts, I'm immediately, without any legal support, being able to, I'm able to look at it and see what works for me and see what doesn't. Um, not many artists can do that, especially at the age of, you know, 15, 16, you know, you barely have any qualifications anyway, let alone to, to you know, go to your mum and dad and say, hey, look, I've been given this legal contract, should I sign it, yes or no? Um, they're probably just looking at the advance and saying, mm, you know, that would be a good idea, but you're locked into, uh, you know, a minimum term, three years, whatever deal that doesn't benefit you, that may not benefit, it may, you know, give you some monetary rewards, you know, you can buy your first car, et cetera, et cetera. But when you, you know, you move to your, your 20s, your mid 20s, your 30s, you know, a lot of artists that we've seen in the past 20 years, like I can't really tell you what they're doing now, you know, from the black community, you know, people who've won MOBA awards, who've been at the Brits, like, you know, what's, what's happened now? And it's mostly to do with the terms that they, they sign. So, Changing those terms would be a, a, an amazing place to start. Monica, Patrick can come to you here as being someone who um, uh, knows more about law than, than I do, which is almost exactly nothing. Um, uh, professor and author Josh Kuhn this week said, if the music industry wants to support black lives, labels and uh, black lives, labels and platforms can start with amending contracts, distributing royalties, diversifying boardrooms, which we've discussed, and retroactively paying back all the black artists and their families they've built their empires on. First of all, do you, do you agree that one thing that big companies can do is go back and make changes retroactively and, and in that way? And is that possible? 
I mean, any, any contract can be amended if you, you know, if the parties agree to. So when you're, when, you know, they, they, there's two things here. So you've got the, the, the historical contracts, which, you know, some of them have been unconscionable beyond belief. You know, when you look at the pennies that are being paid to people, it's ridiculous. But again, this also addresses another issue in that we, that there is not enough, and I can't stress this enough, there is not enough representation of black people within the music industry that are non-talent based. So when you think about those artists who signed contracts 50, 60, 70 years ago, I can guarantee you they were probably represented by white lawyers, white accountants, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not saying, and again, let me be frank, I'm not saying that all of those accountants and lawyers were working to their disadvantage. But then if you have people who can understand where you're coming from, understand your background, understand your community, understand your needs and your wants, then they then themselves can help you strike a better deal. So for me, there's, there's two issues here. Of course, you know, the historical contracts, yes, you, you can amend any contract that you want to, as long as the parties agree to. And there should be some you know, definitely some um, amendments that have happened because I've seen some of them and they're shocking. Mm -hmm. When you're coming to, to, to today, this is where I would say, this is my call out to the black community in that we need more lawyers. We need more accountants. We need more marketing people. We need more, you know, think about all of the different, more royalty people, people who understand royalties because the more representation that we have, uh, you know, the more black representation we have in all facets of the music industry, in all departments of the music industry, then it becomes a little bit more difficult to have these unconscionable contracts that are flying around. Because then you've got various different people who are advising these artists at various different stages of their career. So, you know, it's not just the lawyers who shape the contracts, it's the managers, it's, mm. as I said, it's the accountants. So we need more black managers, we need more black accountants, we need more black lawyers. Um, you know, and this is not, this is not what, I don't want it to be seen as that there's not enough room. There's room for everybody. The music industry is so big mm. that there's room for everybody. So if you see 10 more black accountants coming into the fold, that does not mean that the 10 accountants that already mm. exist don't get any jobs anymore. That's mm. not how it works. There's room for everybody. And that, that's, that's what I would say in relation to that particular comment. Because I read that comment and I felt quite emotional about it. Because like mm. I said, I know people who have signed really bad contracts mm. and, and unfortunately it still exists. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Monica. Keith, I'm sure, you know, um, with your depth of experience, you've worked with people who've probably signed bad contracts. Um, first of all, do, do you think this kind of retrospective uh, repayment or rebalancing of uh, bad deeds from the past uh, is the, the right thing to do? And is it something that can, and there, there is an appetite for it to happen? A couple of things about that. Of course, it, it would be right. The, the, one of the problems is it would be incredibly time consuming, you know, um, because trying to unpick mm. and find out all the contractual relationships going back over, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, whilst it would be nice, you know, I'm much more concerned with what's happening now and the artists that, that are coming through now. And I think that just in general, this, is, this isn't even a black, a black thing. In general, there needs to be a reassessment of how much artists get paid from the current environment, particularly the streaming environment. You know, um, tech is doing very nicely. You know, record companies are doing probably better than they ever did. But artists seem to have been forgotten. And I think it's pretty important for everybody to remember that actually, if there are no artists, there is no business. Mm. Yeah. So let's look at that right from the start and look across the board at the way in which artists are currently being remunerated. You know, there's definitely a, an issue with the way things have, have gone in the digital environment. And, and we really need to have a really good look at that. Um, kind of question onto that, actually, just because, Esty, I thought it was really good that you started this whole thing out talking about being independent. 
Hmm. Some of the questions we've had here that I kind of we've talked to is exactly that the historic ownership deals of, of major record labels and how, you know, probably a lot of times those end up affecting uh, black artists or people that don't hmm. maybe have the, the same level of education. We've had a lot of questions about what can people do to actually educate themselves? And I think and I said, if you could actually answer that, what made you realize being independent? Like, how do you how do you know that? Because I've got to say most artists across the board and I work with lots of them either don't care about this conversation and they should. Mm-hmm. Um, and they think that this idea of the industry is just gonna take care of it. And I think that's across the board. So if there's anything you can talk to about how people can actually educate themselves and connect and what resources are out there, that would be really helpful. Um, right, so I, my background in education is a little bit long. So um, I did a degree in French and Italian. Um, then I decided that I wanted to be a singer. <laughs> so I did a creative practitioner development course that was available um, in London. Um, and that was qualified by rock school. Um, and then I went on to do a PGCE <laughs> to qualify as a French teacher, because as much as I love you know, music, um, I realized that it needs a lot of funding behind it. Um, so I was able to, to you know, self-fund um, a lot of my music and then tap into funds from the Mobo Awards and Help Musicians UK, who have been amazing in terms of supporting me, the Roundhouse in terms of not only paying me to do, you know, headline shows and open up for, for a variety of artists, um, but also support me in terms of they have a studio facility um, and that was great for my development because, like I said, these things cost studio time costs, you know, paying musicians, which I believe, you know, you should do all these things cost. Um, and then I came into an opportunity to do some artist development, which was great. Um, and then I thought to myself, you know what, I really need to learn the business um, because this is my art. Um, and how is it that artists suffer? You know, like Keith mentioned, Milika mentioned, like artists suffer in the end. Do you see what I mean? There's, there's, yeah, the, the, the kind of effort it takes to create um, and what is given back is, is totally unacceptable. Um, and there's not many artists who, who I think can confidently say that they're happy in the position that they're in being signed to major labels. So I decided to do a degree, <laughs> another one, in um, music business management. Um, and I was kindly supported um, through the Richard Antry scholarship scheme that was set up. Um, in his passing and in his um, kind of, you know, memorial. um, And that's what I'm currently finishing up. So I think for me, that has been an extremely empowering process because I can tell you about copyright. I can tell you about live music management, not to the extent of Keith or Malika, Malika, um, but I can give you, um, you know, I I know what's going on. And I think artists need to be concerned about their art they need to be concerned about how they get compensated for it because you can't really sit there in five years ten years time and say oh you know someone took advantage of me or whatever because the information is out there it's really up to you to to seek it out and I hope that you know by me being on this panel as an independent artist I'm not saying that I would never sign a deal I'm not saying that what I'm saying that I will sign a deal when the time is right and also if the terms are good for me. Excellent. Sorry, that was that was quite long. Yeah, but. that was really, that was really, really good. Um, I feel like we might have had a little bit of a frozen Joe here for just a minute. Um, but yeah, we posted some links to the Roundhouse. Thank you for that. Um, that was one of the best answers I've ever had, and I thank you for that for all artists because there is this sort of idea that we come in and we complain about these deals. Mm. And as Keith said, and we've been talking about this quite a lot. Um, yeah, there, there, is, there is a systemic problem across the board here, but it sounds to me that your education answer is, is, is very good. Um, we're kind of getting close on time here. Um, but is there, I mean, do you guys know of any programs or anything? And we just, let's to go on the education side of things of how we go and better educate people, help educate youth, help. Um, the fact that you know all this about an artist is I'm so thankful because most don't and that's why they end up in the deals that they end up in. Oh, he's back. Um, but yeah, anything else that <laughs> Not you internet. Can, I'm, I'm sorry. Anything else that you all can speak to like the education side and what more we could be doing to schools and to actually going in and educating people. I mean, a lot of people don't even realize the music business in a lot mm. of countries is actually a business. No, mm. people don't you know, even think about that. And we get loads of people that want to be artists, loads of people that want to be producers because they see that. But how do we actually encourage and get more people to understand that there is an industry and there is, you know, a, a place and actually bring that education out to people? There are, there are a lot, most of the trade bodies have 
some kind of an education program, uh, even if it's only a, a kind of signposting program. One of the things that's changed in the last 20, 25 years is the number of university music business courses that there are. Um, as they talked about doing a music industry management course. See, that is available now in various places. Yeah, um, yeah, regular universities, private universities. I'm a non-executive director at uh, a company called Point Blank that does a, a music industry management course and a distance learning course. You know, so there's, there, there are places that you can go to get the education, to get qualified. I think it was you, Patrick, that made the point is that artists have to want to do that. Mm. They have to know that that's important mm. and go ahead and take advantage of the opportunities that are put forward. Um, I'm aware that we're sort of running a little bit out of time and we could probably carry on talking all afternoon, but uh, we all have homes to go to and uh, things <laughs> oh, to do. But uh, <laughs> well, yes, well, maybe you have other, I don't know. Um, uh, so, I mean, Patrick, I know we've got, we've got a lot of questions, Perhaps we could, is there, do we have time for one more you can pick out? Because um, we, we have um, a bunch. I mean, there's, there's, there are a bunch. I mean, I guess we've answered some about the education. I thank you all for that. Um, we will definitely try, and after the, the fact, cause this will be on YouTube and those that are yep. watching on YouTube, we'll try to make sure we put as many links to resources in there. Uh, and hopefully people that do watch this back on YouTube, keep the conversation going in the comments, mm. ask more questions. Um, we want to keep this dialogue going and we do want to provide more resources um, and I think that, that that's kind of really where we want to take this. Um, to be honest, Joe, I, I think probably okay. it's best just to, to let us we, wrap we, up here. Otherwise, okay. we might go on well, a tangent at the very end. Great. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, and we, we've spoken, I mean, we scratched the surface today about next steps, but I, I feel like we've sort of talked about significant next steps of, of how the industry in, in, a, in its sort of multifarious ways can move forwards. We spoke a little bit about milestones earlier. I wonder if, you know, Monica, you said that maybe if within three years you'll see companies don't have that representation at board level, it's a sign that they're deliberately not engaging there. Are there any other, again, without sort of asking you to make um, unreasonable forecasts, are there any other sort of milestones that you would like to see happening in a timescale? So we can sort of, we can accurately track change as it's happening. I definitely think, you know, where are we now? We're in June. I definitely think that, you know, by the end of the year, and I'm six months is, is a long time and we're all at home now. So we, we've got some more time. I definitely think by the end of the year, you know, they, they should be mission statements from companies and they should be able to show us that they've made progress within, the, within even the next six months, whether it be they have task force in place or, DNI groups in their companies or whatever the case may be, I definitely think by the end of this year, they should be able to show the steps that they have taken to ensure that their companies are diverse and there are more black, you know, there are more black employees, whether it be a senior level or there are more in black employees, whether it be, you know, just more within the industry because you can do that within six months. I, I don't see why that can't be. Yes, there are some things in which will take a longer time to actually see change. You know, if you're, if you're talking about whether or not people think differently about recruitment, that might take a little bit different, but, or might take a little bit more time, but at least within the next six months, there should be some change within their recruitment policies. You can, schools will be going back in September there's definitely scope to now go to specific institutions and say to them, look, we would like to partner with you or we would like to be able to sponsor this course or internships or go out into the community and say, right, okay, we're happy to fund, you know, a week, five of your students come and do work experience with us. So there are, there are things in which definitely can be done. Like I said, the, the, the longer term stuff, yes, I get that. There may be, you know, it may take a little bit longer to get C-suite staff. And that's why, you know, I agree with Keith in that in three years time, you should be able to see that. But there are still some things at the lower level in which you can, if not affect immediately, at least within the next six months. And I've given you a couple of things, like I said, such as yeah. look at your recruitment policies, look at where you're advertising your jobs, that stuff that could even be done within the next month. Yeah. 
So, so strong, actionable, accountable, yeah. open yeah. statements of intent. Yes, definitely. Sounds completely plausible um, and, and the right thing to do. Keith, anything else you'd like to add to that? Well, I, I would expect to see every major company, company with, say, more than 50 employees, to have some kind of a mentoring and support network in place for the uh, BAME employees to make sure they feel supported and they get the information, help and advice to elevate themselves. You know, and that means the mentoring extends to bringing people into your social network. Because as, as we've said, it's, it's, a, it's a networking business. Mm. It's not good enough for the people to be in the company and never get invited to the dinners or the, the various networking events that are going on, people get in the company and often feel excluded. Mm. So we ought to have somebody who is keeping an eye on that in every company and making sure those people are encouraged and helped to go further. And, and, and those sort of more senior people at these companies need to change their routines and deliberately start doing exactly. this. Exactly, be active. Yeah, active, yeah. Um, Estelle, what do you think? I mean, that's that, that's sort of very industry side things. Mm. What, what are sort of actionable steps that you would like to see? That... I think in, it's just a case of just respecting black artists, um, expect, uh, respecting what we bring to, to the industry, how much money is being made, um, you, know, in, you know, from the art that we produce and making sure that we are represented in all our shades, in all our genders, in all our, you know, intersections. Um, I don't want, you know, for us in three years time to be always looking to Ray Black to talk about her experiences as a black, you know, woman artist who is dark skinned. There are more Ray Blacks, there are more, you know, there's, a, there's you know, I, I always think um, kind of, if you can find a black female hairstylist and a, choreographer and you can find the choir to join your white artist on stage then you could definitely find you know a black female singer I would love to see you know a black female singer have the same successes as Adele as Jessie J as Jess Glynn and all the rest and I think I've been monitoring that you know is for as long as I've been interested in music and that's you know over 20 years and I still haven't seen that so uh, and, and, I, I want to see that. And, and we'll see it. The, the proof will be in the pudding and that we'll see yeah. it on, on our Spotify playlists. <laughs> yeah, say, if, if, if that happens. So can I say yeah. one thing, which is kind of counterintuitive this, but what I'd like to see, I'd like to see that when I go to the big industry events, be it the Ivers or the Brits or the um, Music Producers Guild Awards or whatever, I want a situation where I don't know the other black people in the room. 100%. Yeah. 100%. You know, I, I, to be fair, it's gone from a situation where I, when I started, where you could count the black people in the room on one finger, to now where you can count them on the fingers of one hand. Like, <laughs> I'd like to have to take my socks and shoes off. <laughs> <laughs> The, the, well, there's, there's an image to, uh, to end the uh, conversation on. <laughs> Keith removing clothing at uh, public events. But, um, uh, thanks, Keith. That's, that's very good. Um, I mean, of course, this conversation could continue, and we're aiming to continue this conversation in more sessions here on uh, Music Ally in various ways. Uh, so it will continue. And I hope to have all of you in, in some configuration back again in the future, because that was fantastic. And thank you ever so much. So uh, briefly, I would like to say thank you uh, to, well, let's go, I'll go around clockwise as I can see you on my screen. Uh, Keith Harris, uh, thank you ever so much uh, for your time and your insight. Really grateful. No problem. Thank you. And uh, Malika, similarly, um, thank you so much for your time. If people are interested in entering um, the music industry from a law perspective, as you've sort of uh, mentioned, uh, how can they get in touch with your association to, to get help there? Um, they can, I'm, I'm a bit like Keith, I'm not really into the social media thing, I leave that for the young ones, but I do, I am on LinkedIn and the UK Black Music Lawyers Network is actually a group that's visible on LinkedIn, so if you just search for that um, and just request to be added to the group or just send me a message I'm more than happy I get various people coming to see me at the office all the time so 
Right. If I've got a spare half hour, I will give it to you. No Fantastic. problem. And we will share links to um, uh, the association uh, uh, when we uh, put this on YouTube and uh, it will be in the report that will come out on Music Canada next week as well. So the links will be there to follow. Uh, and uh, Estée Blue, thank you ever so much. Um, thank you for your insight. Uh, you. If people want to uh, interact with you as an artist, uh, and buy your records and, and support you. How do they do that? You can follow me <laughs> on you Instagram. You do do social media, right? Yeah, I so, do, yeah. I do. I'm all about it. Um, Instagram, Twitter, Bandcamp. I love Bandcamp because they don't pay you. Well, they, they do pay you and it's more than 0 0.003 pence. So if you want to support me as an independent artist, it would be great for you to, to buy some of my music on there. And yeah, just connect with me. Um, find me on socials. Great. And again, we'll share all these links. Um, and uh, Patrick, thank you as well. And uh, Kush, uh, so Patrick Ross and Kush Patel, uh, in the, who's hiding in the background, thank you for your help. Patrick, um, what, um, if people want to get in touch with Music Ally, what can they do? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Joe, as always. And, um, you know, hopefully a lot of you are subscribers out there today. Um, and a lot of people have asked what else we're doing and what else can be done. Um, make sure to subscribe to us. Um, if you've got any questions about that, just get in touch. But we, we do have verticals that are covered. Most people are able to be subscribed depending on where you work in the industry. Um, and yeah, please do keep sending us through any other resources, things, uh, especially on this. We do want to carry this conversation on. We don't want it to just be a Tuesday. We want to be this to be something that we're continuing to talk about. I'd love to see a round two of this in, in several months, a year, to actually check back and make sure that you know, these are not just hollow words and that we're actually working for change. So please do just keep reading us and keep sending us stories. We, we get, you know, we get our information from you, the community, and we try to serve it back out to you as well. So anything that people are doing, their initiatives, we've had a lot about education here. Um, I would just love for us to be able to publish more resources and just put that out there publicly and just have more places for people to get this level of educa education, a better understanding of what companies are actually doing and all learn and be inspired from each other. And hopefully, don't just take this as a, as, as a one point, mm. but we take this as a point where there was, we can look went back one day and there was a real turning point and change. Yeah, so and to that point- really appreciate the questions and all the panelists. Yeah, and to, and to that point, we, we do want to run more shows that develop this conversation further in, in, in the short term. So if anyone has any specific um, topic areas they'd like us to discuss, please do email me. That's joe at musically.com or patrick at musically.com and, and we'll try and see what we can do. And maybe it'll be, to, to having spoken about, um, uh, being able to judge when things are starting to change, maybe we can get this panel together again in six months and, and we can actually see uh, if things have happened. We'll, we can, yeah. At least we can hold it to account that way. Okay, um, you can follow Music Ally. For those of you who do do social media, you can follow Music Ally on Twitter at, at Music Ally, on Facebook at Music Ally FB. Um, and this, you can follow us on YouTube as well and see uh, past panels and see how they all fit together to form one bigger conversation. Um, a huge thank you uh, to the audience who have uh, left some really great questions today. And I'm sorry we haven't been able to answer them all, but we'll try and bring them forward into next conversations or answer them perhaps in the articles that are going to follow from this. So thank you for uh, joining us today. And uh, well, it, it's uh, been a really enjoyable session with all of you. And um, thank you all for your time. And that's it. Hope to see you soon. Thank Goodbye. You. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.